I want to thank all of you that <laughs> did your homework assignment. <laughs> you probably didn't know I did that. Look, Revelation promised a blessing if you engage yourself with the book. For, you, for those of you that took the time to draw out the things that I told you, you know, God is well pleased. Especially those of you that put the effort to do the work diligently. In the Bible it says excel and excel still more. That means whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And when you do a little project like that, even a little homework, man, you should give it 110%. Okay? God is pleased and you're going to be blessed. But if you're lazy and you just want Manny or some preacher or some teacher or something to tell you everything that you don't want to take the time to do, that's fine, but you're not going to get a blessing. Okay? So take the time. Do the work. I'm going to give you another assignment here. If you don't learn to do what I'm going to show you, you're going to be lost. You may even be lied to. Okay? Today we're going to talk about symbolism and how to interpret symbolism. There's special hermeneutical principles that are involved in dealing with prophetic literature. People that don't know how to do that, they're all over the place and they come up with the most insane and heretical scenarios, especially for apocalyptic type literature like the book of Revelation or Daniel, Ezekiel, Isaiah. Okay, now we're going to go into the throne room of heaven. John was on the island of Patmos and he was told to write in th three different time frames. That which was past, that which is present, and that which is future. Past was chapter 1. Present was chapter 2 and 3 dealing with the seven churches. That is now over. John is invited up to heaven. He says, and in chapter 4, it's come on up in the heaven through this open door. And John is going to see heaven for the first time. Now, he's in 96 AD. Okay, he's the prophet. And he's got to see all this unfulfilled, predicted events as he goes through the throne room of heaven. He's got to describe what he's seeing based on what he knows. Sometimes I hear stories and scenarios, oh, I went to heaven and came back, and they give, man, they didn't do that. If they did, they would, they, <laughs> and don't believe all that nonsense. There's only been a few select people that have ever done that, such as John and the Apostle Paul. There was only a few that saw the transfiguration, okay? And that was Jesus' select few. So these ordinary people who go, oh, I died, I went to heaven, or I went to hell, I came back, and Jesus, you know, it's all nonsense, okay? I know they wrote a book and movie and all that. Don't believe it, okay? Because if they did, they wouldn't be able to describe it the way John did, okay? God has a reason for this. When he gave us the book of Revelation, Revelation means to reveal, unveiling, taking the veil off. It's because he wants us to know what is coming. Okay, now, here's John. He's, he's going to see, he's going to see some unseen things that have never been seen before in the throne room of heaven. Okay, these are unfulfilled, predicted events. When you go to the Old Testament, there's a lot of predicted events. In fact, 25% of the Bible is, is predicted events. A lot of it has already been fulfilled, and a lot has not. What has been fulfilled? Well, the coming of the, of the Savior, Jesus Christ. That was predicted event. How he was to die, that was predicted event. You'll read about it in the Psalms. Okay, Daniel and given us the uh, prophetic timeline, many of the different uh, empires that came on the scene have already been fulfilled. Israel returning back to its home and creating the homeland again. 
that has already been fulfilled. Now, what John is seeing is at least 2,000 years in the future. It has not been fulfilled. Okay? He's got to see things like the tribulation, the millennial, and eternity, which he has never seen before. Okay? How is he going to explain this? I don't. I was thinking about that, you know, uh, when I was a boy growing up. I couldn't even conceive of people talking on a on a cell phone, let alone where you can see them and talk to them, you know. And in fact, if you were to ask me to describe that, when I was a boy, we had landline phones, you know, and the dial kind. <laughs> For those of you that are old enough to do that. Uh, but to be able to see somebody on the phone and talk to them and carry this phone with you everywhere, I, I would have had to come up with some kind of, you know, idea of what that looked like in my mind and draw it out. Well, that's what John is doing. Well, he's doing this 2,000 years in the future. He's seeing things that it, it, it has nothing to relate to. Okay, so you got to put yourself in his shoes. So I gave you a homework assignment. I said, go to chapter 4, take two pieces of paper, draw out the images you're seeing in chapter 4, and then go to chapter 5 and draw out those images. What I was trying to do was get you to, to put you in John's shoes as he was describing these things, as you're seeing these things for the first time. Okay, now, let me take you a little bit further. Okay? Whenever you interpret symbols, you, the symbols can be either one of two things. Either they can be real, concrete things, or imaginative. Okay? That's the first thing. It's the symbol. It's the object that is being described. Okay? The next thing is the referent. What does that symbol, that object, have reference to? Okay, and then the third thing is the meaning. Let me give you an example. Let me give you a couple examples. We, see, we read in the Bible about the Lamb, the Lamb of God. Okay, we know that that's symbolic of Jesus. Well, what's the meaning? Well, like lambs are sacrificed, so Jesus is the sacrificial lamb of God. You also have reference of a symbol of sheep. And people think of sheep. It's symbolic of humans. Okay? What is the meaning of sheep and humans? Well, like sheep, they tend to go astray. Okay, that's why they need a shepherd. Go look for them, bring them back. Okay, now... Let me read to you a little bit on chapter 4. And I want you to think about the symbols that John is coming up with. Okay? He says, after this, okay, after what? After chapter 2 and 3. Okay, so he was told to write past, present, and future. So after this, in other words, the church has been raptured out. It's gone. It's no longer on earth. We have now entered into eternity in heaven. We're in the throne room of God. He says, after the, uh, I looked, and these before me was a door standing open in heaven. So, he's being transported from earth to heaven. Okay, so this is an area that's taking place in heaven, not on earth anymore, like chapters 1, 2, and 3. Okay, and the voice I first heard speaking to me like a trumpet, okay, there's, there's, there's a symbol. Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. After what? After chapter 2 and 3. You will not see the church again in the book of Revelation until the very end, and that's for a reason. And it's important to understand this as you interpret the book of Revelation, or you'll come up with all kind of false scenarios. Okay, okay. At once, 
I was in the spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. Who was that person sitting on? Why is this throne in heaven? Okay, all these questions you got to do. They're what they're called observational questions. And then you're going to get to what's called interpretive question. Observation is what is there. Interpret is what does this mean? And the one who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian. A rainbow, isn't this interesting? The rainbow with all these lesbian, gays, and bisexual, and transgenders. One of them. So this is very symbolic of the kind of throne room this is. Okay, it's not an ordinary throne room. It's a throne room of judgment. These people that are uh, displaying all this, you know, to promote immorality and throwing this in the face of God, their day is coming pretty soon, okay? A rainbow representing an emerald encircled the throne. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones. And seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. So we know a couple of things. I know how to do this interpretation. So I know that these 24 elders cannot be Jewish people. Okay? I also know they cannot be angels because they don't live and die. Plus they got crowns. Jewish people don't get the crowns until then, the millennial. Okay, we get the crowns at the Bema, the judgment seat of Christ. So the 24 elders have to be, there's some, have to be representative of something. What do they represent? Okay, they were dressed in white. Who gets dressed in white? And had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings and peals of thunder. Now, why is that? What does this demonstrate? So a lot of times in getting the interpretation, you got to go back to the Old Testament and New Testament where it has references. Okay? And then right away, you know, John again, he's describing things that he's seeing based on what he imagines or knows, and a lot of what he knows and is coming from the Word of God, from the Old Testament. Okay? From the throne came flashes of lightnings, rumblings, and peals of thunder. Before the throne, seven lamps were blazing. That's the symbol. What does that symbol refer to? What does it mean? These are the seven spirits of God. Now, see, right there in the text, you're going to find that the symbols are explained like they were in chapter 2 and 3. He's going to give an explanatory explanation of what those symbols represent. Okay? Be very careful about assigning a meaning to a symbol that is not intended. For example, uh, a white horse and a lion. The white horse is ridden by a bad person and ridden by a good person in Revelation. The lion is referred to Jesus and to the devil. So, how do you make that distinction? Well, sometimes it's the characteristic of a lion. A roaring lion, like Satan is, seeking whom he may devour, has an evil intent. Okay? But a strong lion of Judah, that's to come to your defense. You've got to be very careful in doing this. Okay? Before the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. What are the seven spirits of God? See, here again, and, and as I talked about in chapter 2 and 3, we honestly believe that that is the Holy Spirit. So what you have here is the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit in the throne room of God. John is exposed to them, and he's having to explain them the only way that he knows how. Also before the throne was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. Man, can you picture that scene? I don't know, that would be awesome. In the center around the throne were four living creatures. Why did he describe them like that? And they were covered with eyes. All, all over. In front 
and in back. What is that ref reference to? The first living creature was like a lion. Okay, so what I got here is some different symbols. The throne in heaven, 24 thrones of elders, seven lamps, four living creatures full of eyes, and each of them had six wings. One was like a lion, another was an ox, another was the face of a man, another a flying eagle, you have a rainbow, sea of glass. So you got all this symbolism in, in there. Okay, and the fort was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and covered with eyes all around, even under his wings. Day and night, they never stop saying, and then he's going to talk about what they do. Okay, here's what I want you to do. Remember, in doing finding symbols, three things, three steps. The symbol, whether it's real or imaginative, the referent, what the symbol represents, okay, and then the meaning, okay. If you don't do your homework and you don't study the Bible, the Old Testament, New Testament, and everything else, so you can put it all together to give a grasp of what it's saying, you're going to come up with, it's best to do at this point, if you don't know, to just say, I don't know. Don't try to assign a meaning that you're guessing. I, I never do that. I, I will tell people, this is, if, if I'm like that, I'll say, this is my opinion. But I really don't know. Okay? People are uncertain about this. Okay? Like, for instance, what we're going to do here, the seven lamps. Okay, that's a symbol. Is that real or imaginative? What is that referring to? What does it mean? Do it with all these. Do it in chapter 4, then do it in chapter 5. On the next message, I will give an explanation of them. Okay? Because we've got to understand something. In chapter 4 and 5, it's real important. John, you and I, are being introduced to what's coming in the tribulation. The preparation has to be set in 4 and 5 to understand the significance of what God is doing during the tribulation. If you don't get that, you're going to miss the whole thing of the book of Revelation. Why is God going to bring on this destruction and death such as this earth has never known before? What is this setting the stage for at the second coming of Christ? Okay? Pay very close attention. While you're doing that, integrate. What is the world like to now? As I talked about in the last church of Revelation, in chapter 3, the church of Laodicea, there were two characteristics. One, the world is under a delusion. Two, the church is currently blind to its spiritual condition. In that state, Jesus raptures the church out. Okay? John is now being introduced to this world where there is no more believers and the Holy Spirit, the restrainer, is taken out. And what's going to happen to the remaining people on earth through the tribulation? What's going to happen to Satan during that period of time? What's going to happen to Israel during that period of time? What's going to happen to people that become believers during that period of time? And then what happens at the end of the tribulation and sets the stage for the beginning fulfillment of the Davidic covenant which, which God promised to David that he would establish his throne in Israel for a thousand years. This is exciting stuff, but it's only exciting if you study. The Bible tells us, study to show yourself approved as a workman who need not be ashamed. During the day that goes by that I don't read something that somebody posted, I, somebody did this morning, then I answered it. That uh, something that's embarrassing, you know, and uh, make themselves ashamed. 
because they don't accurately study the Word of God. And in the Bible says, study to show yourself approved unto God as a workman. Yeah, it's hard work. Granted. And we live in a time and age where people uh, are, they want everything uh, microwave, instant, shake and bake. You know, they don't want to put the time in the work and study the Bible. Therefore, they're, they're subject to other people's interpretations or belief and so forth. Well, if that's you, shame on you. And you're being disobedient to God. Okay, because he says, not just for pastors and teachers, for every believer, study to show yourself or prove as a workman who need not be ashamed, accurately, accurately handling the word of God. And that word accurately is a really interesting word. And the only way you're going to know what that means is if you studied the historical, cultural condition that Paul was in when he wrote that. Okay. Hard stuff, but you get a blessing. Which do you want? Okay? You want to be served ice cream or you want meat? You want to, you know, sip on your mother's nipples or you want to eat meat? Okay? That's up to you. Okay? You, you want to be a sheep that wants to be led around by false prophets and apostles? Or do you want to be a pillar? Where other people come to you and say, hey, help me. Paul says to Timothy, find other faithful people that you can teach these things to who in turn will teach other people. I know that of the thousands of people that watch this and that are on followers and all that, there isn't a whole lot of them. Okay, but there are a few. There are always that remnant. Which number are you going to be in? God bless. You feel this has been valuable to you? Pass it on. Okay? Share it with others. We'll see you in a few days. Bye.